You just answered a question I had forever about why when you can't a bow that it shoots right or left. Um, and it's the exact same pr- the exact same principles that you're talking about. If you about. can't a bow to the right, it's going to miss right and low. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. Huh. <laughs> <laughs> so. Welcome to the Hunt Back Country podcast presented by Exo Mountain Gear. This podcast and the gear that we produce at Exo Mountain Gear share the same purpose, to make you a more capable, confident, and successful backcountry hunter. Straight to the point, no fluff, and no BS, this show is all about providing you with valuable information from experienced hunters. To learn more about the podcast or our backcountry hunting packs, please visit exomountaingear.com. Well, here we are for episode 72. You guys are in for a treat. Our guest is Ryan Kleckner, who is a former special operations sniper. Ryan is joining us in our Building a Backcountry Rifle series, not to talk about gear, not just to talk about the technical aspects of rifles, but to get down to the fundamentals and discuss how we can be better shooters in the field. So we've discussed things like caliber and cartridge selection and optics as part of this series thus far, and we have more discussions like that coming. But this two-part series with Ryan is going to be incredibly helpful for actually getting behind the rifle, whether you're at the range or, more importantly, in the field and making effective shots. So as you'll hear, this is a great discussion in part one. As soon as we recorded it with Ryan, we weren't initially planning on a second episode, but we knew during this episode we were going to have to get Ryan back for part two, and we did just that. So be sure to tune back in next week. Also, Ryan is the author of the Long Range Shooting Handbook, and he's given us 10 copies to give away to you guys. So what we're going to do is, from the time that this episode is released in the first week of April, all the way through the month of May, every week, we will be giving away at least one copy of Ryan's book to you guys. So it's really simple to enter into the giveaway just go to exomountaingear.com forward slash shooting book. All one word, shooting book. So exomountaingear.com forward slash shooting book. From there, you'll get the instructions on how to enter. It's going to be incredibly easy. So be sure you do that. There'll be multiple chances to enter the giveaway. One from this podcast as well as one from the part two with Ryan that is to come. So once again, in the Building a Backcountry Rifle series that we're in, we want to thank Weatherby for joining us and supporting us in that. Can't say enough of good things about the experience that Steve and I have had thus far with our Weatherby rifles, and there will be more to come on that. All right, let's get into this show with Ryan Kleckner, author of the Long Range Shooting Handbook, and discuss how you can be a more effective shot with your rifle. Well, Ryan, welcome to the show. How are you tonight? Thanks for having me on, guys. I'm good. I'm good. Yeah, man. Thanks for joining us. And Steve, you're on as well. How you doing, buddy? Doing good, man. Just uh, plugging away here. Yeah. So we are excited to uh, to get into this and kind of talk some firearms tonight and hopefully uh, pick up some wisdom from you, Ryan, on things that can improve our shooting Obviously not just at the range, but what really matters is uh, make us more effective shooters, therefore more successful hunters out in the field. Uh, before we kind of dive into those topics, could you go ahead and kind of give us your background and uh, talk a bit about your experience on the firearm side of things? Sure. I uh, well, I grew up in Arizona, and that matters because my shooting experience was more long range than it is now that I live kind of back east or in the south. We had a lot more open areas back there, and I actually grew up archery hunting also with uh, big game animals in northern Arizona. You know, elk hunting was all that mattered to our family. You know, everything else was just getting ready for the next elk season. It's a good family. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you, know, you go have Lena hunting for fun and for practice, and, and elk hunting is, is what matters. <laughs> so I joined the military, and I was in 1st Ranger Battalion in Savannah, Georgia, and ended up going over to the sniper section and being a sniper team leader there. Did a couple deployments to Afghanistan right when Iraq was starting up. Uh, there was a chance for me to either re-enlist or go back home and go to college at Arizona State in Tempe 
And I thought that Tempe would be nicer than Iraq. And a couple times in Afghanistan was fun for me. And so I said, you know what, guys? Uh, I'm going to leave all the parties till fun. We're all friends. <laughs> Take care. Yeah. I want to go back to college. So I went and did that. And uh, Todd actually had a government contract at a sniper school out in Phoenix for, for a few years. And I absolutely love teaching almost more than I like shooting, which is which is shocking because my life literally revolves around guns. So not only do I stay in the firearms industry, but I, I went along to law school and I became an attorney. And I, I've i worked as the vice president of Remington most recently. I opened up my own law practice for firearms law. Uh, now I represent FFL dealers and manufacturers through the industry. So I am uh, was a board member of SAMI. I don't know if you guys know what that is. That's the... Uh, yeah, like ammunition the, standard setting organization. Yeah, I was going to say like SAMI specifications in terms of reloading. Exactly, yeah. yeah yep, okay. SAMI spec, yeah. Well, also for gun manufacturing, right? For those of you that don't know, if you heard SAMI spec before, that doesn't mean it's a certain level of performance, like good or bad. It's just a threshold that says, if you've got a gun that says 30 out 6 Springfield on it, and you buy a box of ammo that says 30 out 6 Springfield in it, they're going to be a safe combination to use in each other. Right. That's all. Just to make sure that nobody made ammo too hot or a gun too weak. So it's kind of nice to have guns not <laughs> blow up on you when you're shooting. <laughs> yeah. Minor detail. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, they're supposed to go boom, but not that way. Right. <laughs> yeah. So uh so I've stayed in the firearms industry and I, I've competed quite a bit. I love three gun shooting. Uh if you guys are familiar with that, it's a, you know, action, fast paced, uh, pistol, rifle, and shotgun shooting. Um and just again, I, I like teaching, so I even teach for example, I teach constitutional law at the University of Alabama uh, down in Huntsville. I just drive down there and teach classes. So I like it so much that when I was working at the NSSF, that's the National Shooting Sports Foundation. They're the people that run the SHOT Show, and they're the trade association for the industry. I was running federal government affairs for them, and they asked if I'd do some videos on long-range shooting. And I said, sure, because what I love doing most in teaching shooting, and I hope we get into this here, is breaking down these seemingly complex things into just really simple stop sweating the details and just get out and shoot type stuff. And we did a couple of videos and the feedback from the videos was way better than any of us ever expected. And years later, I, I finally have some time and I decided to write a book. And I thought honestly that maybe, you know, my mom and a couple of friends would buy one you know, so I could <laughs> say on my resume, hey, I wrote a book. And it was a good learning experience on you know, how to organize it and how to get it printed and publishing and things like that. And uh, It's been out for 10 months now. It's called the Long Range Shooting Handbook, if you guys don't mind the plug. Yeah, for sure. Uh, not, not at all. And it has blown me away on on the sales and the, the feedback it's, it's had so far. I'm a little over 10,000 copies sold right now. Wow. And I donate 25% to military charities, so to the Stu Esponte Foundation and the Special Operations Warrior Foundation. And I'll tell you what, that 25% sounded like a lot better idea before I sold 10,000 copies. <laughs> <laughs> You're writing a big check now. Yeah, there, there's a few checks. I'm like, oh, well, it's a $25 book. Oh, man. You, you so, thought you were giving 25% of your mom's 25 bucks. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, that's what I thought. I thought yeah. No, I'm, I'm kidding. I, of course I'm kidding. I'm glad to support these charities. I've, I've made actually good friendships out of them. Uh, one of them, when I first... I uh, reached out to them. They're kind of like, uh, yeah, whatever. We don't care. And then their, their tune changed a little bit. Oh, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> we like this. Yeah. And the, uh, the Suez Fonte Foundation has just been a great support the entire time. That's a, a specific charity for First Ranger Battalion helps those guys out. So anyway, oh, it's, it's been cool. great. It's, it's led me into seriously considering doing more of this kind of stuff. I mean, now that I know what I can do with a book, I just kind of want to stop and write more books. But yeah. well, I don't know about you guys, but I'm too busy. I, I never get the time. Yeah. Did I see that you kind of did announce there's a, a second edition or like an advanced long-range shooting handbook coming? Is that confirmed? Uh, dude, that is confirmed. Okay. I was supposed to be done by the end of this month, and it's not even close. <laughs> <laughs> I hesitate even bringing it up. So it's coming. You know? Just stay tuned. Definitely coming. So I was actually thinking, I don't know, you guys tell me, have your listeners tell me or you guys tell me. I was thinking just for a promotion because I felt so bad that people were waiting for this. I was going to try and get it in time for Christmas. I was thinking about, not confirmed, that maybe if they anyone buys the copy of the book from me in, I don't know, December, you know, some period of weeks that I would just put them on the pre-order list for a free copy of the advanced version. Um, I, I got to figure out the dates, but if you guys are interested reach out to me and let me know and I'll run a promotion like that. So at least you can 
support the current book, get in on a, pr- a free pre-order of the other one, and that way you guys uh, won't be too mad at me for taking my time. Yeah. No, that's cool. I think that's a pretty good idea. Yeah. Yeah. Did you, um, we're kind of diving off on a rabbit trail, but I'm just always curious, did you kind of self-publish this? Did you work with a Fallout publishing house, or how did that work? No, I self-published it. So I first I reached out, sent a couple just shots in the dark, you know, emails saying, hey guys, uh, writing a book, don't know how this works other than uh, words form sentences, sentences form paragraphs, you know, so <laughs> yeah. where do we go from here? And of course, I got crickets in response. That's not to say they chose to blow me off. It's just they probably get thousands of unsolicited emails a day. And I said, you know, I'm just going to try and publish it myself. And I looked up through Amazon, and the percentages they give are incredible. They, they give you, for anyone that's out there interested in publishing their own book, I will give you free advice. Reach out to me. Uh, if you guys share my contact information with them, especially if it's outdoor-related or veteran or anything, I will absolutely love to help you get you on the right track because I learned so much from this process. But hmm. you can get almost half of the cost of the book back through Amazon. That's unheard of in the publishing industry. Yeah, And you get to control it. So there's been a few things I'd wanted to edit or change after it's published. I just upload a new file, click a button, and that's it. And I don't have to have any inventory I haven't had that, you know, like a lot of authors, they have a room that's full of books in their house. Mm-hmm. Uh, parent, you order it from Amazon, then a book pops out the other side of the machine and gets sent off. Yeah. So, so they're, like, like, they're doing you know, the printing. They're doing, obviously, the distribution. They're doing kind of the whole everything. deal. Yeah. Everything. I gave electronic file. They sell it for me. Now, I order, I, I, I do try to keep about 50 or so on hand because on the book's website, which is a long URL. It's the long range shooting handbook.com. I sell autographed copies for people that want them. So mm-hmm. I'll send out a few books a week just because people want to have it signed and I'm happy to do that. But the real reason the website is there is to have the supplemental info that I reference in the book. Yeah. You know, so I'll be talking a certain chapter about a link to somewhere or diagrams. And I, I hate, I don't want you guys going to a computer typing in an entire URL you know, from something, you know, somewhere in a book. So I just went ahead and put all the links up there and yeah, yeah it works out. Yeah, that's cool. That's a good idea. Very good. So, and then just to mention too, while we're kind of on the, on the topic, if guys, you know, hear this episode and want to uh, hear more, learn more, uh, just to mention briefly, you also have a podcast as well that you've kind of started and are working through. That's right. I, I do. Uh, it's nowhere near what you guys have going on, but I'm trying. I, I call it the Going Ballistic Podcast. Uh, because I thought it was a cute name, but I don't really go <laughs> ballistic on it. So I don't know if it's appropriate or not. But yeah, like, a going ballistic podcast, I'm on there trying to talk through all things long range shooting, maybe a little other firearm stuff. Easiest way might be just to look me up on Facebook. You know, Ryan Kleckner, you'll find my page there. And it talks about the book. And I keep things going on Instagram with photos of shooting and different, you know, bullets or loads I'm working with. Um, you know, you'll find stuff on a website too at ryancollector.com. So if you want to get a hold of me, any one of those avenues have their own website, all with a contact, you know, Ryan button. You can you can reach out and ask me questions. And to date, I've taken the time to answer every single question I've received because I figure someday I'm not going to have people asking for my opinion, so I might as well give it to them. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's give it to some listeners now and uh, and dive into some of the goods. So. I would love to start, Ryan. Let's, um, you know, there's so many places where we can take this conversation about trying to pull from your experience, obviously, um, and all the training that you've had behind the gun and what we could talk about. But I would love to start at the moment. Let's say we have a hunting situation, targets acquired, the range is known, and we are already in proper position behind the gun. So those are already, you know, several things we could talk about, but let's assume all that's taken care of. So we're behind the gun. I want to go through, like, what are the steps? What's going through your mind? What are you doing physically before you actually execute a shot? And here's where I'm coming at. Like when I, I I was pretty much self-taught with archery and I, I learned fairly quickly through trial and error that coming up with a shot sequence was super helpful for me. And so I sort of had this mental checklist of like four to five things I would do as part of every shot and how I executed that shot. And, it, you know, at first I was super intentional about that. But obviously the more you do it, you know, it becomes second nature. You sort of go yes. through this routine without thinking of it. But what are some of those things if you can kind of give us tips on 
how you're executing a shot and maybe some of that routine or those steps that you you were going through personally or you would recommend other shooters do? Good question. Uh, so it's easy because there's really only two I'm going through my head. But before I tell you what they are, <laughs> you're doing the right thing with that mental checklist, by the way. I'm a big believer that consistency is the key to accuracy. So if you do the same thing every time, even if it's wrong, as long as you're just as wrong every single time, yeah. you're going to be accurate. You know, I joke with students on the range, if you're pointing the rifle at the target and you smash and jerk the trigger and yank the rifle five feet off the target, but if you do it every single time, exactly the same five feet, we'll just mount your scope crooked and you'll be the best shooter in the world. <laughs> you know, so it, it doesn't matter uh, that what you're doing is, look, is is pretty or not. You know, it just matters that you're doing the same thing every time. Now, I'm overstating that, of course. Uh, you need to have good fundamentals, and we can get into those later if you want. But when I'm coaching a, a shooter, I'll only be watching them. It, it's irrelevant to look at the target. By the time the bullet hits the target, your entire job is over. Mm-hmm. You know, that, that bullet's downrange. So what you're doing matters, and what you're doing is hopefully dry practicing with an empty gun way more than you're shooting. So here's a divergence from archery. I want people with their rifles to be shooting that gun empty way more than they're shooting the gun with ammo in it. I know you can't do that with a bow. But <laughs> Not the reason is, <laughs> right, with a rifle, though, you don't have the big bang, you don't have the recoil, you don't have the flash, you don't have all that stuff that not only will give you a flinch, but it gives you direct, perfect feedback on exactly what you did to the rifle. That's mm-hmm. really easy to hide or mask within the gun going off. And it doesn't matter what happens after the gun goes off. If you're able to make that gun go click and have the reticle not move on the target, well, that was a perfect shot. Because, again, all you do is everything that works up to the shot going off. So mm-hmm. to your question, sorry for the diversions. No, the two things I'm stuff. thinking about in my head are focus on the reticle and steady pressure on the trigger. That's it. Okay. Everything else will work. So I, one thing I want to make sure we get into before we're done with today is what I consider an acceptable amount of accuracy. So without going into that now, though, mm-hmm. if I could put on an MP3 player and just give this MP3 player out with headphones to everybody instead of actual instruction, the mantra I would have, and I repeat in the book over and over, is exactly that. Focus on the reticle, steady pressure on the trigger. And the vast majority of time people miss, it's because they're not doing one of those two things. So much so that a student that is just getting frustrated sending rounds all around a target down on a range, I will often get down next to them, adjust the focus on their scope so they can't see the target very well, or have them shoot at something that's not very defined. You know, like shoot at a blank piece of paper Mm -hmm. instead of one Mm -hmm. with a dot on it. Yeah. And tell them, I would actually stand over them while they're in the prone behind the rifle. I'd stand on either side of them. I'll bend down and put my finger on the trigger. And I'll tell them just over and over, focus on the reticle. Focus on the reticle. So you're saying specifically, you're not only focus in terms of mindset, but visually, obviously, you can only focus on one thing at the same time. So you're saying you're focusing visually on the reticle versus the target. So in our situation, if we have you know, an elk downrange. Yeah, you want to pick an aiming spot in that, but really your focus as you're executing the shot is on the reticle itself, not on the animal. Yes. Okay. Now, and you're right. You huh. can't, I can't say ignore the target or else you're sure. going to shoot a tree and the elk is going to be behind you. <laughs> yeah. Right. So you got to know the elk is there. But once you but, acquire that target, you know. Yeah. Now, when we're talking precision rifle world too, where I come from, right? So where your people are wanting extreme accuracy at extreme distances. Mm-hmm. So I'm even saying up close. I mean, when you have buck fever kicking in full blast and the elk is only 100 yards away and you're aiming at the elk and there's easily a pipe light size kill zone on an elk. Mm-hmm. Right? Right? So it, I, I propose you guys would do way better in real world hunting scenarios by ignoring where in that kill zone you're actually aiming, but instead focusing only on your reticle and applying steady, consistent pressure to that trigger. You will get way better hits than worrying about being in the dead center of that kill zone and actually jerking the trigger Mm. and having the shot completely miss the kill zone. Yeah. It's it's funny how it works. You kind of got to let go to let it happen. Right. By forcing too much control on it, it's going to make it worse. 
Yeah, it's, the com- it's like the complete opposite of what you know we do with try to shoot both eye a bow with both eyes open and blur out the pin and focus on the target. It's yeah, really I'll shoot with both eyes yeah. open. I, I still will do that. Uh-huh. Um, but that's more of a I received all my training with two legged targets, and two legged targets have friends that you might want to have both eyes open to see if their friends are close. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I shoot both eyes open because I don't want to strain. I don't I don't want to lose the focus of my eye. Mm. But yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, I see what you're saying. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's like what you were just saying too about that um, trying to be perfect, trying to be dead center versus trying to just have that reticle steady within the kill zone makes me think of, you know, how we try and be perfect on the archery side of things and then end up getting target panic because we get that, oh crap, this is the perfect moment, must execute the shot now and we can't relax, we can't let there be, you know, any movement or anything else because we just, we freak out. Yeah. Uh. Um, so here's the problem we all do this monologue in our heads and i'm taking a wild guess here but i'm sure you guys say the exact same thing i do almost almost a little more left a little higher a yeah. little left <laughs> right about uh-huh. now yeah. right you guys do the exact same right. thing and then right? just slam it yeah oh that's so yeah. wrong yeah, yeah don't exactly. do that. yeah you especially with shooting a rifle i think i propose shooting a bow is the same thing but shooting a rifle especially when you're trying to go for precision or good group that is a recipe for failure. And what you're going to do is you're going to keep doing that for so long that you're going to get good enough at it that you're going to fool yourself into thinking you're doing it the right way. Yeah. Yeah. So you're going to get decent enough accuracy out of that. And it's going to take so much concentration and so much practice that you're going to think I finally got it. When really I'd rather, if I were teaching you know someone to shoot a rifle, I'd rather break them down, get rid of all those habits and get them even better by, by trying less. Mm. Hmm. So what what do you do then with movement as you're sort of focusing, as you're focusing on that reticle and it's moving? Again, maybe you don't have a, a perfectly 100% solid rest. Again, we're shooting in the field in a hunting situation, heart rate's elevated, etc. Do you just let that movement happen? I mean, we have that kind of, again, on the archery side to equate things, the idea of like the pin float, meaning focus on the focus on the target, let that pin float, you know, and that Um, sort of acceptable accuracy range. Do you have any sort of similar concepts on any movement in the sight picture as you're focusing on that reticle? Yes, and none of them involve any of the tricks you've ever heard, (laughs) which are, (laughs) you know, doing a figure eight or trying to choose when it passes. No, you're you're still choosing for the rifle to go off. So so my training, of course, came from, like I jokingly said before, two-legged targets, but Hunting applies here also. Most guys I talk to want to be target shooters, not necessarily hunters or military snipers. But our world, well, I think we get this. The target often dictates when it's time to shoot. Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah. A target shooter can sit there for 30 minutes until he's really ready to shoot that target. We, however, have the moment the target presented itself, turned the right way, stepped out behind a corner of a tree. That's when it's time to shoot. So I don't like having the mental checklist I agree with, but I don't like having a set physical uh, motion I do or even breath pattern. So many guys will get so stressed about, well, I heard the heartbeat matters and you're shooting the rifle. I'm like, well, yeah, fine. At extreme distances and extreme situations, yes, you can see your heartbeat and scope. But you're way more likely to judge the wind wrong. You're way more likely to jerk the trigger and have any of that kind of stuff matter. So instead, I like to get guys focusing on the basics, the fundamentals, and shooting. And so that pin float you mentioned happens with the reticle. I mean, a pin is nothing more than a sight. Right, yeah. So Mm -hmm. when that reticle is moving, I just don't want people looking at the target. I want them looking at the sight or the reticle and just let it move and start putting pressure on the trigger. And when it goes off, you're going to hit. So what I do is there's a drill that I learned at the sniper school I used to teach at that I really loved. And it was, we called it the LAPD drill. And I, I hope you guys don't mind we talk about two-legged targets for a little bit. Go ahead. For background. <laughs> All right. So the North Hollywood shootout, if you guys remember that bank robbery that happened in North Hollywood where those guys wore the body armor. Mm-hmm. And they just shot and shot and shot and got way too many cops. And none of the cops could take them down because nobody was able to make a face shot. They couldn't get a shot on the face on these bad guys because they were wearing body armor from head to toe. Mm-hmm. So what I do is I have these sniper students practice at 100 yards. I put up a six-inch plate. So let's just call it a kill zone. Let's call it eight inches and a kill zone at 100 yards. And I challenge these highly trained snipers to 
start from the standing position as if they're walking. We're going to make this hunting now. They're walking through the woods. And they want to drop to a knee for better support and take two shots into this kill zone of the 100 yards. Then drop to the seated position and take two shots. And then drop to the prone without bipod legs, with actually holding the rifle in their elbows and take two more shots. Getting those six shots off in 60 seconds is near impossible for the best snipers out there until they learn to let go and have an acceptable amount of error, kind of like what you're talking about. Mm-hmm. I mean, I would have military units come out. I'd have uh, military units I either used to be in or sister units of mine or, or other snipers come out and try this with these $10,000 snipe rifles and miss more than half the shots at 100 yards. These are supposed <laughs> to be these amazing snipers because they're used to being bipod legs, the rear sandbag, and perfectly calm and perfectly still and not having the rifle wobble around on them. But what I would have is after 10 or 15 days of having them and coaching them every day, all day, I would finally instill in them the theory of just forgetting about being perfect, focusing on that reticle, let it float throughout the whole circle. We all can keep the pin or the reticle in that kill zone. Mm -hmm. So you guys shooting at 45 yards, 50 yards? Archery, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You can keep the pin in a kill zone at that distance without trying too hard. What you can't do is keep the pin perfectly still at that distance, which is what you're trying to do. Right. Mm -hmm. So what I have these students do is say, I don't care if the reticle is on the edge of the target. Because what happened here is when we're talking about even the kill zone, we're admitting that we've defined the size of the target. Whatever the kill zone is to you, the kill zone for you guys might be smaller than it is for me. It might be in a different location than it is for me. But whatever it is, you're the one that made the decision on what that acceptable kill zone is. And if that reticle can move from one edge of it all the way over to the other edge and back again, who cares? If you apply steady pressure while that reticle's moving and the gun goes off or the arrow gets released and the sights of the reticle were at the very edge of the kill zone, well, I don't know. That's called a hit to me. Right. You hit the edge edge of the zone that you just said was acceptable to hit. Mm -hmm. And if it goes off when it's on the other edge, who cares? That's also called acceptable. That's also called a hit. And when I can finally get guys to see that versus the mentality of I got to be dead center and waiting for it to be right in the dead center and then jerking the shot and therefore missing the kill zone completely by trying to be too perfect, you can just really see like their the their eyes pop open and they finally get it like, oh, yeah, I would be happy anywhere within the kill zone. So why don't I just let the reticle move, stop trying to control it, instead let some pressure go into the trigger and either let the arrow release or let the bullet go and just trust that no matter where I am within the kill zone, I'm going to be happy. So that, that's that's the big takeaway. If you can do that, uh, you're years ahead of other people learning how to shoot. No, oh, that's that's good insight. So that that reticle focus, and obviously that uh, you know working with that movement within the reticle, that acceptable bon- amount of accuracy. That's half the picture, or uh, half of what you said you were going through before the shot, and then the other half was the trigger control. So. Let's dive into that and talk about trigger control. Everything from how you're applying pressure to where, um, you know, on your finger you have the trigger placed. Is that on the first pad? Is it first crease? I mean, kind of talk us all through this uh, this idea of proper trigger control. You're asking good questions. <laughs> <laughs> you 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 are you're catching me cheating here. When I said, well, it's only two things. Well, okay, you're right. There's twenty <laughs> things in each one of these two. Things. Well, there's two categories. Okay. <laughs> yeah, two categories. There you go. Yeah, for yeah. now. Um, so for trigger control, um, to continue my trend of kind of whatever works and don't stress about the minutia. I don't care where your finger is on the trigger. Honestly, I like to shoot with the pad of my finger, or maybe. Uh, a third of the way from my first joint out to the pad of my finger. So not quite dead center. That's where I like to shoot. Okay. But if I can get you shooting by focusing on the reticle, applying steady pressure on the trigger, which we'll talk about in a second, and you have a good platform, you have a good stable position, and you're shooting great that way, I'm not going to come and tell you to get your joint of your finger off the trigger because that works for you. Same kind of thing when it comes to rifle setup. So I've heard you guys... Uh, I listened to some, back to some of your podcasts. You talk about bow setup. People will dedicate podcasts to talk about how to set up a bow, but they won't talk about how to set up a rifle. <laughs> it's just as important. You cannot get on a rifle and scope and expect it to fit you. 
you know, mm-hmm. in, in one of the NSSF videos I did, I talked about it's kind of like asking a race car driver to drive a race car when the seat and the pedals and the steering wheel and everything are not the right adjustments for them. It's not going to work. They still might be great. The car might be great, but it's got to fit them. So getting all that set up, and we can get into that if you want, getting it to fit you and you happen to like your head more to the side than me, God bless you. Keep it that way. You know, Don't try to do what everyone else says is perfect. There's a, there's a good photo out there of an Army marksmanship unit uh, pistol shooter, and she's shooting beyond the crease of her finger, like down to the second section of her finger on the pistol. And I saw some guys online immediately try and rip the picture because they didn't know that she was actually on the Army shooting team. Oh, you never do that. And they all quoted back what they've been, been hearing you know, over and over of how you're supposed to shoot a pistol. And finally, some other people, including myself, chimed in like, maybe she knows what she's doing. <laughs> Use what works. <laughs> So, sure, pat your finger, but if you don't like shooting there, don't shoot there. Learn to shoot however you want to. Okay. Now, the trigger pull, the best way I can tell you to think of it is drawing a line in the sand. So it's easy when you're laying in the prone with a rifle to reach over to the ground right next to you. you. Stick your trigger finger in the dirt and draw, I don't know, a 10, 12 inch line in the sand. That should replicate what's going through your brain your trigger pull. You should truly imagine drawing that line in the dirt. Do that a few times and put your finger back on your trigger and trick yourself into thinking that you're doing that again, even though your finger's on the trigger. And what you're going to do is you're going to add, 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 add pressure onto that trigger until finally the trigger breaks and you're going to keep adding that pressure for a few moments after the shot goes off for good follow through. So I don't care how fast you do it. Again, the target decides often when it's time to shoot. I don't really think it needs to surprise you. I just think it needs to be consistent. So that steady pressure, build, build, build that pressure, trigger goes off, keep adding that pressure as good follow through, and I think you're going to be fine. And that follow through is just because the bullet doesn't leave, doesn't immediately go 2,500 feet a second. It starts at zero feet a second. And then builds up to speed. So similar to like a bow, you guys are going to keep the pin somewhere on the target. You're not going Mm. to drop the bow immediately. Same thing is true with a rifle. That's good. So I've always, you know, just my own shooting, have found it helpful to think of squeezing the trigger versus pulling the trigger again. Because being, you know, uninformed and ignorant, I developed a, you know, bad habit of kind of slapping at it and really pulling it versus giving it that steady pressure. But that... That drawing the line in the sand seems to make a ton of sense as well. I think yeah, that's pretty helpful. It's a good visualization for sure. Yeah. So yeah. Here's what you do when you or somebody else is jerking the trigger. Shoot to your non-dominant hand. Uh-huh. Just stop what you're doing. I'm right-handed. Most of my students are right. Most people are right-handed. Immediately, I can tell that they're jerking the trigger. Like when I told you before, I'd stand over the student and have them focus on the reticle, and I reach down. This happens more often than not. I'll reach down and pull the trigger for them on the rifle that they're on and hit the target. And then I'll have them put their finger on the trigger and I'll put my finger on top of their finger and I'll show them so they can feel the pressure I'm putting on their finger and make them pull the trigger. But if they're having a hard time, so if they're they're jerking the trigger, yank the rifle out of the right shoulder, put it in the left shoulder and say, shoot the target now. You'd be amazed how great people do with their non-dominant hand. With a rifle, they typically do better. Hmm. I'll have most students shoot better groups with their non-dominant hand because they don't have the same thing that you and I both have, which is bad habits with right. that hand. Yeah, so you they have to unlearn have to things. Focus. Yeah, they have to focus. Okay, pressure, 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 pressure. Let the thing go off. And it's amazing watching their face every time it happens is that the group gets better and you have to explain to them, yeah, the group got better because you just let the gun do what it's supposed to do and try it next time. See if you guys like it. We want to take a minute to thank First Light for sponsoring this podcast. First Light apparel is something that I have been wearing for years, obviously in the field when I'm hunting, but also I love their gear so much. I just have it in everyday colors as well. In fact, just this week, I've been wearing the Vapor Stormlight jacket a bunch. You know, there's the proverbial joke about April showers. Well, that's definitely been happening to us. The Vapor Stormlight jacket is only 12 ounces. It is incredibly compressible and packable, yet provides excellent um, weather resistance. 30K water resistance, as well as 42K breathability. 
if you listeners don't understand those numbers, do some research on specific numbers for rainwear and learn all about that. But First Light has their gear tested and is proven to meet those numbers and those standards. So one quick tip I do with my First Light gear, as I mentioned, I wear it in the field, of course, but specifically with my rain gear, I get it in the solid colors. So my Vapor Storm Light jacket, I'm wearing it to the office. I'm wearing it whenever the weather's bad, year-round. It's a great piece of kit to have. If you need some new rain gear, definitely check out what First Light has to offer. So you, you mentioned breathing um, and how, you know, that that isn't everything. Um, obviously, the the timing of the target being available, if you will, in a hunting situation or in a two-legged situation with your past, you know, sometimes you can't get perfect breathing. But I am curious if you have any tips or any ideals, at least, with our breathing. And I'm thinking specifically of situations, again, in the field where we, you know, we're dealing with elevated heart rate. Um, elevated breathing, trying to calm ourselves before a shot in the field, whether that's because we're excited or whether it's because we just, you know, had to run up a ridge side to get that shot. But any sort of tips on, you know, settling in um, and calming our breathing to make a good shot? I don't know about calming your breathing. You know, that's just going to be difficult when you mm-hmm. have buck fever kicking in and your heart rate's going so bad that you can hear your heartbeat in your breath. <laughs> With your mouth open. I I know we've all been there. Yeah, Um, yeah, I've had a cow tag and had an elk bugling in front of me and still had my heart about to jump out of my throat, even though I knew I wasn't going to shoot just because it was so cool seeing an elk bugle 20 yards in front of you. Yeah. Um, So you're just going to have to get over that with practice. But what breath to shoot on, I think completely exhaling is the best. Now, most books you read and most, you know, backyard sniper experts all say that you need to have a half breath of air. Well, I challenge everybody listening right now to tell me exactly when their lungs are halfway full. It's really hard, (laughs) especially it's hard to do every (laughs) single time. So going back to my consistency is the key to accuracy. I can empty my lungs the same every time. So it also is a psychological calming effect to take a big breath right before I shoot and just (sighs) build pressure, let the gun go off. The downside to that, there's a danger to this. That is, you're going to sit there with an empty breath while you go through that monologue of trying to get a perfect trigger pull. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and you're going to run mm-hmm. out. Of, you're going to run out of air, and you're going to start shaking again. Yeah. So this does take practice. Um, given all the variables you have to worry about, I'd worry about breath the least, and worry most about having a stable position and good trigger control. Because even with your breath moving you, you're still going to be okay. Now, when you're unstable and your breath is really affecting your position, of course. You got to worry about that. Yeah. Awesome. I'm glad you mentioned positions. It's a note I had that I want to get into. But before we do that, um, just real quick while we're sort of on these topics of trigger control and side alignment, and you even mentioned how important it is to practice with dry fire. What does that look like? So for the guys who are at home, um, who want to become better shooters, who are willing to dry fire, any specific drills any specific concepts that they should be practicing with this reticle focus with trigger control or is it really just a matter of you know get in proper position get behind the gun and and work those things over and over so the trick to dry fire is not getting in the perfect position so the problem is so many people worry about um, the exact right recipe to shoot a rifle and that's because that's what magazines say or books or movies or things like that say. And you guys know as well as I do, you can't even count on one hand the times you've been in the perfect position in the hunting situation. Right? It doesn't happen. Yeah, yeah very true. So, so training some of the local guys, you know, local police snipers, because I like to stay involved you know, in teaching or the shooting community. And when I was out at the range with them recently, I noticed they're all shooting in the prone for their qualifications, you know, for, for their training. And I finally had to stop them and ask them, guys, how many times in the real world are you in the prone? And they stopped and were kind of looking at each other and, and discussing amongst themselves. And I said, the reason you guys have to think about this is because you never do it, right? Yeah. And they all finally admitted, yeah, okay, you're right. I said, yeah, because in the police world, they dive into the prone and you're going to see curbs and tires and trash cans and things like that. And when you're hunting, you're going to see rocks and grass and logs and things like that. That doesn't happen. 
more often than not, you're on a knee or resting your rifle on a log or some rocks on the side of a tree or some weird cattywampus position that you got in because by the time you looked over and saw the animal and you realized you couldn't move anymore because they were closer than you thought they were. Or that's just the angle you can get in. So the problem is people go to the range and they'll shoot off of benches or they, maybe they will lay down on the prone and they get these perfect positions, which of course are great to zero your rifle, but they're horrible to practice in because you're never going to be in those positions. And even if you are, you've got that covered. Don't worry about that anymore. So instead, go home with your rifle, check 10 times that it's unloaded, make sure there's no ammunition in the area when you're dry firing. When you dry fire at something, you should prop your elbow up on your knee and put a small piece of painter's tape at the furthest distance you can in your house and put the reticle on that painter's tape, focus on the reticle, and apply a steady pressure on the trigger and see if you can make the gun go click without the reticle moving. And then just try that over and over and over. And if you do that, or if you even go back to that drill I talked about where I you used to call it the LAPD drill that you know kill zone size target at 100 yards from kneeling, seated, and prone. And for some strange reason, I got called back up into the military and I had to go back out on a mission again. The one thing I would do over and over is that drill more than anything else to get ready for real world shooting situations. Because that would teach me the good breath control, the good trigger control, the good position, the things like that. Now, I mean, if you have the chance, shoot off your back. Uh, you guys, do you hunt with backpacks? Yeah. 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 I don't like shooting off bipod legs uh, at all if I can help it. I like shooting off my bag. Uh, one of the reasons is I like having my bag in front of me so when I need to reach up for camelback tube or a candy bar or something because I'm hungry or thirsty, the bag's right in front of me. That's kind of nice. But the other reason I like it is it allows me to have the exact same shooting platform no matter where I am. So when I lay my rifle on some rocks, it's actually on my back or on a log or on grass or on dirt or on asphalt or the hood of a car for the police snipers. It's the same platform every time. And going back to that, you know, consistency is the key to accuracy. I, I think that's really important. So your question of at home, dry practice what's not normal, what's not comfortable and just get really, really good at making the gun go off without the reticle moving when you pull the trigger. Yeah, awesome. That's good. <laughs> so I'd love to dive into uh, different positions. Um, obviously, keeping in mind what hunters would encounter, and as you said, it's hardly, if ever, the ideal. Um, in those those videos you referenced earlier, I've, I've actually went and watched some of them, and one that I thought was super helpful is how you broke down some of the positions. And just high level talking about, you know, the closer you are to the ground, the lower you can get, the more stable, or the, the easier it is to get stable, I should say. And so we talk about prone, um, you can come up to sitting, to kneeling, to standing. So if you could, Ryan, can we kind of go through those, maybe those four, or if there's others, and kind of address those specifically from a in the field hunting situation and maybe some tips to do at each of those positions if possible. Sure. And they, they all involve first using a sling as a tool on your rifle. So I'm a big believer that the sling is just as much part of your rifle as the scope or any other part is. So yeah, having just, a hunting rifle without a sling is crazy. To you you got to have the it field, on. right? <laughs> well, sure. It's not just a purse strap though, right? I'm giving you a tell, so, yeah. Yeah, I actually, I actually had a student. I hope he he doesn't listen to your podcast. I uh, had a Louis Vuitton luggage strap on his rifle. Oh, gosh. Came to a course. I took a few pictures of it, so I had it for posterity. But it, it ties into the joke of the the sling is not a purse strap. It's not just something to you know put the rifle over your shoulder. It's actually a shooting tool. So you're right. In the video, I talk about the closer you are to the ground, the more stable you are. But the further away from the ground you are, the faster you. Are. Right, So you're walking across the ground. You should not have your scope on its highest magnification. One of the things I harp on in the book is that high magnification is not good. It's actually a negative. So magnification is not your friend. I think I have that in like an outset like bullet point four or five times in the book. But if you're going to have a variable power scope, you should always be walking around with it on the lowest power. That gets rid of all that wobble and that shake 
and good luck finding the elk at the highest power anyway when you're walking through the woods. When you're in that unstable standing position, at least you can shoot quick. You can pick up the rifle and take a shot quickly. On low power, you're going to be able to find the animal through the scope easier. You're not going to have tons of wobble. You're going to be fine. If you have a moment, if time and the situation dictates, you want to get lower to the ground to get more stable. So go ahead and drop down to a knee. You can go ahead and put your arm into what I call a hasty sling, which is passing your support arm all the way through the sling so the, the sling is up in your armpit, wrapping your arm around the sling once and getting back to the stock of the rifle. And of course, you've set it up ahead of time, so you, you know how it's got a little bit of tension there. Drop to a knee and getting your support elbow just past your support side knee. So I'm right-handed, so I'll drop down on my right knee have my left elbow up in front of me, or my left knee up in front of me, and my left elbow I'm going to put just past my knee because you don't want bone-on-bone -bone contact. And you, you guys have a chance to try it. So You'll see if you put your tip of your elbow on your knee, it'll slide and wobble all the way around. So instead I'm putting kind of the, the bottom of my tricep up against my knee when I'm shooting. Yeah, so past is in forward ahead of the knee. Correct. Right, okay. And the sling should be tight enough that when I let the rifle settle down. When I let the rifle drop an inch or two naturally on its own, the sling gets so tight that it locks into position. That's a great seated position. You can adjust the height from that with my shooting side. So for me, for right-handed, my right foot, I can either bend my toes under, kind of put the ball of my foot on the ground and sit on my heel, or I can lay my foot completely flat on its side and get a little bit lower, a little more, you know, a little sta more stable. Going from that position down to the seat of the seat is a weird position, but I really like it. If you guys practice it, you'll you'll be surprised at how, how well it works. The standard, you know, competition style, what basic sniper schools will teach you style for seated position is a cross-legged position or, you know, quote unquote Indian style seated. In order to do that, you need to face your body 45 degrees off the target to the direction of your dominant arm. So since I'm right-handed, I need to not face the target. I need to instead face my lower half of my body 45 degrees to the right, cross my legs, and then I get my arms, my elbows, into the pockets of my knees, and I can shoot. And if you can kind of picture that, that puts my rifle back facing towards the target. The problem is you get so bent over and so uncomfortable, I think it's miserable to shoot that way. So instead, I like the crossed ankle position what I do is I face my legs straight at the target. I cross my ankles. For me, I put my left leg on top. I bend my knees slightly and allow my legs to fall out naturally with a slight bend of my knees. And then I just fall forward. I just let the whole weight of my body hang forward. I try to hook my left elbow past my left knee, so further out then. And I'm not that flexible, which is why this position works, and I don't fall completely flat. And I just hang there. It looks silly as can be. It feels awkward as can be. But it's amazingly stable. And it's really useful because it gets my rifle about two feet off the ground. And for you guys, when you're hunting, for when you're walking around, most places you're at, two feet off the ground is perfectly clear. So it's a good position to be in. And then, of course, the prone position. Everyone's familiar with that. Yeah. That's, that's easy to work with. You know, Some people like to cock their shooting hand side leg up which will tilt their chest off the ground a little bit. That's a really neat trick to get rid of all that breathing problems because it allows your, your chest and belly to go kind of out to the side mm. instead of straight down. So you can kind of like what we call it a frog leg. You lift your, you know, for me, for my right leg, my right knee way high up on the ground, which will give my diaphragm some room to breathe. However, I like to shoot completely laid flat. I drop my heels all the way to the ground. I lay as flat and straight as I possibly can. But whatever works for you is what you should practice. Yeah. So can you kind of talk a bit, you know, because this goes obviously hand in hand with position, but about support. Um, I mean, as you kind of mentioned, we have the pack. Some guys might be using a bipod. But then there's also things like shooting sticks, which some hunters carry, if you want to speak to that good. But I'm interested in here you know there's plenty of opportunities to harness uh, natural support if you will in the field be that you know trees or what have you and maybe how some of these positions can interface with support and how we can effectively use support in the field all right sure well first off the only thing that you should be resting only part of your rifle you should be resting on anything is your stock 
Okay, so your barrel doesn't touch anything. You pay a lot of money, maybe, to have a free-floated barrel rifle, which means your barrel's not touching anything, not even the stock. Don't waste that by resting your barrel on the tree branch. <laughs> Instead, rest your stock on the tree branch or on your pack or on the rock or something like that so it can help you know, isolate your barrel. But I believe, like you guys probably do in glassing, so I'll sit there with my legs crossed on the side of a hill and my pack in my lap, a pair of binoculars for all afternoon if I can do it and try and find something. Well, I'm using that pack in my lap to support my elbows and support my binoculars so nice and stable. Why not do the same thing while you're shooting? That's a great position when you're on a hillside that's sloping down away from you is to throw your backpack in your lap, throw your rifle on that backpack and put it in your shoulder and shoot that way. That's a really good way to shoot. You know, shooting sticks are nice. Uh, they're really stable when you know the target's going to be a certain area, but they're very hard to move left and right. You know, I will take even uh, trekking poles. You know, some people hike with essentially ski poles, but for hiking, you don't have to buy shooting sticks if you have those trekking poles. You can just take the handles from the trekking poles and loop them together, and it makes like a little saddle almost between the two trekking poles, and you can use that. So again, it's nice and stable, but you all of a sudden need to shoot you know, 10 degrees left or right, good luck moving the sticks and getting moved over. Instead, I think you'd be a lot better off using your backpack. Hmm. What about, um, you know, maybe taking advantage of a tree or something that's nearby if we're standing or kneeling and how we might grip that tree as well as the, you know, the forearm or the stock and sort of interface there to create some support? Okay, well, first off, uh, if you have a horizontal branch sticking out from the tree, use that for sure and put your Put your rifle stock on that limb. Just be aware that if you're using a smaller tree, what you're actually doing is putting a 10 or 15 foot flag in here that shakes and says, hey, I'm over here. <laughs> you know, so be careful <laughs> when you're getting in those small trees and you're getting your rifle set up that you don't just take the top of the tree and shake the, you know, the crap out of it so the animal can see the whole tree moving. Um, so horizontal branch, absolutely the best for sure. But very often... So in northern Arizona, for example, you have pine trees. You don't have horizontal branches at hunter height. You have the side of the trunk. This is where the sling can really help out. If you're shooting on the right side of the tree and you're a right-handed shooter, you can either grab the sling and help hold the sling against the tree to support the front of the rifle. Or something I like to do is even though I don't shoot off of bipods, I keep bipod legs in my rifle. You can drop the bipod leg down where the tree is going to be and pinch it against the tree. So when I, for a right-handed shooter on the right-handed side of the tree, I'll drop the left bipod leg and I will take my hand and put it, my left hand and put it thumb down. So pinky up, thumb down, and I will pinch the bipod leg up against the tree. And it makes a very nice stable. You can pivot and move from if you need to, to find targets in different areas, shooting platform. Same thing on the left side of the tree. I drop the right bipod leg pinch that right bipod leg up against the tree with my left hand and use that for support against the tree. Hmm. So you're dropping that bipod leg essentially parallel or nearly parallel with the tree and then bringing them together there with the hand. Exactly right, which is awesome. why I think it's important to go ahead and splurge and get bipod legs that pivot. Hmm. Don't get the cheap bipod legs that are fixed. Okay. You know, get them so they can pivot so you can get it to lock into the angle that you want it to. Because sometimes it's okay to have it angled in your hand. Sometimes it's the best way the palm of your hand holds it against the tree. But you don't want that to dictate the angle of your rifle. Because if you're shooting with a rifle that is not perfectly up and down, you might as well throw away all that information you gathered on what it does at distance. Mm. You, know, you have that rifle angled at just a couple degrees off left or right. You have a chance of missing the target completely. Mm-hmm. Okay. Good stuff. So you know you're shooting why, on. Why is that? Is that? Go ahead. Is that just because the scope is kind of just like canting your bow? Essentially, you're just not when it, when when the rifle's not perfectly vertical. But what's the reason that you're missing left and right? Well, yes, it's because your aiming device is above the actual barrel or the arrow for a bow. Uh huh. So, I mean, of course, we'd love to look through the barrel. That'd be the best way to aim at a target, right? But we can't. There's a bullet in the way. So we have the scope on top, and we look through that instead. And the problem is the scope is looking straight at the target while the barrel is angled upward. So even at 100 yards, which is close for rifle distance, 
the barrel's angled relatively up while the scope is angled straight at the target. So if you can imagine that um, if I could draw, if I could pause real life and I could come in with a, you know, an NFL play-by-play marker, I could just draw a dashed (laughs) line from your scope all the way to the target, it's going to be a straight dashed line. But if I draw the line from your barrel, which is the original path of the bullet, it's going to be angled up more severely than you think. And then it's going to immediately start arcing all the way to the target. And the reason it's arcing is because it's falling away from its original path. Well, when we're setting up, I don't know, what's a far shot for you guys for hunting for a rifle? Yeah, four, four or 500 yards, yeah. All right, so 500 yards, shooting a 308. You're going to shoot about 12 minutes of angle above your 100-yard zero. So you're going to be shooting, what, 60 inches over the target. You're going to be aiming 60 inches higher than you would have at 100 yards to hit a target at 500 yards with a 308 Winchester. But your scope is still level. Your scope is just as level as it was at 100 yards. But your barrel is angled so much higher that it's pointing 60 inches higher at that 500 yards. So it can drop in and actually still hit. So now imagine taking that rifle and twisting it one way or the other and turning it on its side. Let's, let's just take it to the extreme for an example. Let's just lay the rifle completely on its left side. Your scope could still point straight at the target when the rifle's on its left side. But now the barrel is pointed to the left. It was pointed up, but we laid it on its side. So now the barrel's pointing to its left, and it's also perfectly flat with the ground. So that means we're going to miss way left, because that's where our barrel is pointed out. It's pointed 60 inches to the left. And we're going to miss way low, because now we don't have any compensation against gravity, because now it's perfectly level at the ground. So going 90 degrees at 500 yards is 60 inches left and low. That's huge. (laughs) And then everywhere in between is exactly proportionate. So at 1,000 yards, a degree or two off is 30 inches. It's huge. So that rifle needs to be perfectly up and down, if possible, so it's consistent. Now, again, if you want to shoot the rifle at 45 degrees all the time, God bless you. You do that. But you just need to do it every time. So when you're at the range and your rifle is straight up and down, and that's where you gathered your data and you said, all right, I know at 500 yards I need to come up 12 minutes of angle. Well, then you know what? When you're hunting, for that to work, that rifle's got to be perfectly level still. And if you have fixed bipod legs that aren't able to pivot or, or have any motion in them, good luck finding a perfectly level piece of ground out while you're hunting. Huh. You just answered a question I had forever about why, when you can't a bow, that it shoots right or left. Um, and it's the exact, <laughs> same pri- the exact same principles that you're talking about. If you about. can't a bow to the right, it's going to miss right and low. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. Huh. <laughs> <laughs> so does that, does that visualization help, I hope, for the, for yeah. the listeners? You yeah. picture the arc going to the target. And if I tilt the bow or rifle right or left, that arc also moves right or left. And I, I lose the elevation... For gravity, and I'm also pointing the elevation towards the direction I'm twisting. That's crazy. Huh, yeah, now, there's a way to compensate sense. for that. So I'll, I can teach people if they want. You, have, you know, My favorite way to shoot low underneath something, let's say, I don't know, you happen to be hunting and you have to shoot under a car, <laughs> <laughs> Try, trying to make it out hunting. You know, you, There's a way to teach and compensate for actually sh- learning to shoot your rifle on its side and just dialing the scope, the adjustment. So... Um, one of the things I didn't say in my background is I write some long range articles for recoil magazines. Sometimes it's kind of the, you know, the, uh, the glossy, sexy, you know, uh, firearms magazine. And the most recent issue, I, I cover all this in an article about angle of the rifle and how it shoots. Huh? Yeah, that was a very helpful, uh, illustration that you explained it. Yeah. Very good. I'm just racking my brain right now. It's so, yeah. <laughs> Steve's, so having have a a Steve's having a level. moment. I'm having a moment. Yeah. Put a level uh, on your sights and focus yeah. on the, the yeah. pen and ignore the elk. Ser- try it. Ignore the elk and you'll be better. You know, when you guys go shoot, I'm sure you shoot at paper sometimes. Yeah. For, yeah you know, right. trying to zero your bow. Yeah. Yeah. Try shooting at a white piece of paper and watch your group get better versus a bullseye because you got to stop staring at that target. Yeah. 
Huh. Super helpful. I have uh, about 70 more questions that I could ask you, Ryan, but we're uh, definitely coming up on time. Yeah. We're going to um, have to do a part two. Yeah. I think we do yeah. if you're up for okay, it you guys are. Yeah, of course. Yeah. I mean, there's so much we didn't even clearly touch on, you know, kind of the long range and getting into uh, an additional conversation about compensating for angles in the field, you know, compensating and estimating for wind. I mean, there's so much we could cover, but uh, it was like yeah. a whole book on the topic, right? I know, it's like, yeah, it's like you could just, <laughs> I bet you could write two. I'm waiting for a guy to come out with a second book to, to the first That's one. That's funny. No. <laughs> yeah. So for people, for a teaser, if you guys want to do a future, first off, I'd love to just have me back. Um, the big things that matter, of course, are going to be focusing on the reticle and trigger control. But the biggest variable, which we didn't even discuss at all, that affects the bullet's path that are going to make you is going to make you miss is wind. Mm-hmm. So the biggest variable by far on the bullet is gravity, but that's also the easiest one to account for because it's essentially the same wherever we go. So you don't worry about that one. But the next biggest variable is wind. That's going to make or break you is wind. I, a matter of fact, I don't care, guys, if you shoot with a crooked rifle. Your wind call is going to make you miss by more. Yeah. And then after that, oh, yeah, you go into angles. You, we can go into the spin of the earth. If you're <laughs> shooting at distance. I'm not kidding. Coriolis, the Obos effect. You have angular velocity acceleration from the spinning earth beneath your target. It gets a little little geeky. Yeah. <laughs> the good news is that, we hunt in the mountains a lot, and so do our listeners, and there's essentially never any wind in the mountains yeah, or angles. When so, there is wind, it's always blowing in the perfect direction for you. Yeah, so we, we have that going <laughs> oh, yeah, for us. Oh, getting into that, angles shooting up and down. You guys yeah. know that with bows, right? Oh, yeah, yeah absolutely. You compensate for up and down? Yeah, yeah. for sure. And yeah, you always treat it like it's closer than it really is. Yeah. yeah. Quick. Quick question: Ten at ten thousand feet in sea level, bullet trajectory is relatively the same. Completely different. Completely different. Okay. Yes. I'm, so the, I'm just making this up off the top of my head, which is dangerous. But I would say the difference between four and five hundred yards across flat ground is less than the difference between zero and ten thousand feet elevation. Okay. Wow. At the same target distance. So elevation is a huge. I mean, if you're Living in Oregon, sighting in at sea level, and you come out to Idaho and are hunting at 8,000 feet, you're talking a big difference. Well, yes, at distance, right? So everything for right. shooting measure yeah. in in angular measurements because mm-hmm. that same angular measurement is really what change is happening. Now, how big the angle has to do with real life is how far away the angle is getting, right? So that minute of angle I talked about before, you know, that about mm-hmm. an inch at 100 yards, which we can talk about in the future, gets bigger and bigger as it goes on. So you're absolutely right. It's not the elevation, though. It's the air density. And the yeah, difference is right. you could be at the same elevation and have your barometer go crazy one way or the other because a storm is coming in. So it's not necessarily how high you are. It's how thin the air is. And that has to do with temperature, humidity, and, of course, elevation. Oh, yeah. uh, interesting. So, Ryan, uh, uh, now that we brought this topic up, I can't leave it alone. Um, <laughs> you know, I know that there's obviously ballistics calculators out there and you can, and some of them say, you know, like you're shooting this load and you're at this elevation with this temperature, et cetera, et cetera. Are there specific ballistics calculators where the variable can just be elevation or barometric pressure or what have you so that if you were... Um, you know, you had a certain dope chart at sea level and you're going to hunt at 8,000 feet where you'd actually plug in that, that change in a calculator and it would recommend at least, um, what changes you might be looking at. Yeah. Look at you breaking out the term dope chart. (laughs) Um, (laughs) yes, you can. So most good ballistic software programs actually have a setting in there where you can ignore all the variables and just go for the actual relative air density. Because, okay. again, it doesn't matter how high you are, how hot it is, or how humid it is. What matters is the effect it has on the bullet. And there is a common variable there that, that affects the bullet that you can just use instead. So um, we can get into this in the future, of course. There's another article I wrote on that one that people can find for free out there that talks about how even your weatherman, when they're talking about feet above sea level or barometric pressure, that's actually a normalized barometric pressure. So the barometric pressure that you have, we can equate as, oh, that's a high air pressure versus a low air pressure because they already compensate for every 1,000 feet when they give you that number. Mm. So using the actual density altitude, using the real figures, definitely helps. But, oh, man, this goes so far down the rabbit hole um, (laughs) someday on the ballistic coefficient of the bullet and, you know, supersonic versus subsonic transition zones. 
the problem is it gets so geeky that guys like long range shooting because it gets geeky. It gives them something to think about during the day. Yeah. It gives them something to worry about. But the problem is that's all they think about. And instead they don't focus on the fundamentals. So I'll have guys come out to the range with the latest wind meter, with the coolest ballistic software, they know the exact ballistic coefficient of this bolt they're shooting and exactly the velocity at what temperature their powder burns. And they'll know all of that and they can't shoot. <laughs> yeah. So I would rather somebody learn how to shoot first. So people ask me all the time, I, I listen to your guys' podcast and you're talking about the spine of an arrow and what should it be and you know, it's impossible to answer. Well, that's what everyone asks me, right? What gun should I get? Well, I don't know, but start simple and go spend a few years learning how to shoot. Then come back yeah. to me and ask me how the spin of the earth affects your bullet. Because yeah. <laughs> until then, <laughs> you're going to jerk the trigger way worse than the spin of the earth is ever going to affect your bullet. Yeah. yeah. I went, went down that hole with archery equipment where I just kept getting geeky and geeky and geeky. And Mark, I know you went down the same path. And then yeah. eventually you get to a point where it's like, you could do all these little things to just affect your, you know, group a half an inch or this or that. But at the end of the day, it just comes down to your shooting technique and you give the best shooter in the world, the crappiest bow in the world. And he's probably still going to be the best. So it comes down exactly to exactly right. Down yeah, to I the shooter. People, yeah. You know, what's your budget. And if you had $2,000 and you wanted to get in a precision rifle shooting, by all means, you should get a thousand dollar system. That's rifle and scope, which is still pretty cheap when it comes to rifle shooting. And spend the remaining thousand dollars on training, and mm. you'll be way better than the dude that buys a two thousand dollar rifle and doesn't know how to use it. Yeah, absolutely. And, and like you said, even if even if you are doing something self taught and what have you, as long as you're consistent, like that's that's big. So actually putting in the time to shoot to become consistent, even if it's not perfect, but, but to right. become consistent in what you're doing can be can be big. And that's what comes down to having the gear that's just okay now. I mean, I mean it. Mm. Go get yourself a decent rifle. And rifles are extremely accurate for extremely cheap today. It's amazing what they can make now. Go get yourself a decent scope. And as a general rule, your scope should be definitely more than your rifle. So if you have $1,000, mm. I'm going to have you buy a $400 rifle and a $600 scope. Because you need that right that scope to adjust precisely each time. So you know that your you know adjustments are consistent and then go shoot your heart out and practice and when you finally get someday to be able to shoot as good as that rifle and scope can shoot you're going to be way better than you ever need for hunting mm -hmm. you know that that price range i can get somebody a 400 dollars rifle 600 dollars scope and get them to shooting one minute of angle which is one inch per 100 yards which means they will get to the point where they can hit a pie plate at a thousand yards I don't know go. why you need to be better than that. Yeah. <laughs> right. Right? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. I guess so, that falls you into your idea of acceptable accuracy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Pipe yeah. Well, guys will laugh at me all the time. They're like, oh, one minute of angle. Oh, you only shoot one minute? I'm like, no, guys, hold on. You guys all <laughs> brag that you shoot a quarter minute of angle. But if we're going to be honest with each other, all the groups you shot yesterday sucked. And you blamed them on, oh, that, that bullet was a flyer. I hate that excuse. Oh, that, that was yeah. a flyer right there. That one doesn't count. <laughs> or, oh, I jerked the trigger there. Or I pulled that one. I did this one. I had a bad burrito last night. You know, whatever reason, you didn't <laughs> shoot that group good. And then all of a sudden, like the stars align and you shoot a one quarter minute angle group. That's the group you take a picture of and you put on Instagram and you save and say how good you and your rifle are. Yeah. Well, the problem right. is hunting doesn't give you 50 different groups at the Do over. <laughs> yeah. So and I tell people one minute of angle of accuracy is what I consider acceptable for any of the snipers while I was in or while I worked for. They laugh at that. They, oh, that's such a crappy standard. I said, no, no, no. One minute of angle right now. See that rifle? Pick it up. There's the target. Shoot within one minute right now. Yeah. And that means maybe leaning off the tree. That means maybe with your heart beating. That means maybe after running up the ridge. That means not knowing the distance exactly. And so focus on that instead of sitting at the range and shooting pretty little groups. And you're not only going to have a way better understanding of, of shooting and how to run your rifle, but you're sure as heck going to have a much better time shooting when you're hunting because that's what you're going to care about is getting the animal, not worrying about how pretty of a group you can get. Yeah. Awesome. Mm -hmm. I think that's a, a perfect thought to conclude on. Yeah. Um, we'll definitely uh, get you back to talk about angles and wind and all that, but Ryan so appreciate the time and 
the information that you shared with us tonight. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks for having me on, guys. Sorry, I uh, I got off on all those topics. No <laughs> way, man. That was, that was perfect. So yeah. yeah, it was perfect. ideal. It was great. We really appreciate it. Oh, right, well, good deal, guys. Thanks for having me on, and uh, ask me back, and I'll be there. All right. Well, that is a wrap on part one with Ryan Kleckner. We have a bonus entry keyword. If you guys go check out the giveaway that we talked about in the intro, you'll see that there's an option to enter with a bonus keyword from the first episode that you're listening to now. The bonus keyword for this episode is going to be focus. So remember that focus that we talked about in this episode, whether you're focusing on the target or focusing on the reticle and what you need to do to take the best shot. So for the episode one or the part one episode bonus keyword with Ryan, enter focus. Again, to enter this giveaway for 10 uh, books that will be given away in the next several weeks, go to exomountaingear.com forward slash shooting book, all one word, exomountaingear.com forward slash shooting book. We hope that you guys hit the subscribe button on this podcast, not only for part two with Ryan, not only for the rest of the Building a Backcountry Rifle series, but just all of the great content that we have lined up to bring you guys in the next several months and all the way into hunting season and beyond. As always, if you're enjoying this show, we'd love to see a review on iTunes. That would help tremendously. And you can always reach us directly by sending an email to podcast at exomountaingear.com. So let us know if you have any questions, comments, or other feedback. All right, until next week, part two with Ryan Kleckner. Hope you guys have a great week.